Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Once again on this Lord's Day, we gather to worship, separated by COVID, together in spirit as God's people. Our distance in this empty church is an act of love for those who we love too much to risk. Find a place where you're comfortable, where you're at ease, where your spirit can be at rest, maybe a candle. And today is the first Sunday of the month, Communion Sunday. I hope you remembered to have the sacramental elements at hand. And if not, just pause the button and correct that omission. Let's begin with an opening prayer. O Lord, our God, you are always more ready to give your good gifts to us than we are to seek them. And you are willing to give more than we desire or deserve. Help us so to seek that we may find, so to ask that we may joyfully receive, so to knock that the door of your mercy may be open to us, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Come to me, Jesus says. All who are weary, come to me. And you who he carry heavy loads, come to me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us draw near to Jesus, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. When we gather to praise God, we remember that we are people who have preferred our wills to his. Accepting his power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we fill our lives with comfort and convenience, distractions that consume our energy and time. We chase after wealth and power as if they could satisfy the hunger in our souls. But you have beckoned us towards new life, a life made rich through Sabbath and service. Free us from the yokes that bind us and draw us near to you while we learn to walk with Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may, may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Hallelujah. Before we read this morning's scripture, Let's pray for illumination. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all we do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our first reading comes from Romans 7, verses 15 through 25. Listen, the word of the Lord. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. 
For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And our New Testament reading comes from Matthew 11. Jesus has just talked about John the Baptist, and he turns to the crowd, and he says, To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Did your brow furrow while I read from Romans 7? I suspect that each of us shares Paul's frustrations. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Can a leper change her spots? An Old Testament prophet asked that question, then answered it in Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good when you are accustomed to doing evil. Now, I'm no expert on alcoholism, but I do know and have known alcoholics. The hard truth of alcoholism, there is no cure, but through a lot of work, it is possible to control. But the danger remains. One drink is too many, two are not enough. The recovering alcoholic has not changed The recovering alcoholic is only learning to cope without drink, and many have done just that. For more than a dozen years, Pearl and I have been friends with a consumer of correctional services. He was institutionalized most of his life since his father and stepmother dropped him off at the former Montana Children's Home in Twin Bridges. From there, it was the Pine Hills, industrial school in Miles City. Eventually, he graduated to Montana State Prison and other penal institutions affiliated therewith. Shortly after we met him, he was on parole and married 
our one-time neighbor, one of Pearl's oldest and dearest friends. No booze is a standard restriction placed on most parolees. When the probation and parole officer caught, caught our newly married friend enjoying a beer, it was back to Deer Lodge and the not-so-friendly confines of Montana State Prison. It seems difficult to comprehend that one can be an addict in prison. I do not know how many of those incarcerated are addicts, but it is significant. It's too many. It is an indictment on our correctional system. Our friend was and is an addict. Our friend loved Jesus. Our friend loves Jesus. Our friend was and is a Christian. Visiting him in prison was almost like going to church. We were blessed every time. His letters sometimes seemed Pauline. After 18 years, he was paroled a second time. We did a happy dance, but it did not work. The demons of incarceration and addiction were overpowering. Our good Christian friend violated his parole and went back to prison. After six difficult months, he was released again. This time it is going much better, and he told me why. It is because this time he understands he needs to change, better yet, to be changed. He remains a Christian who happens to be a convict and an addict. Has he changed? I think it's bigger than that. I think he is experiencing the power of transformation. There is some debate about whether people can change. Jeremiah thought not. The spiritual and psychological sages down through the centuries basically agree that people can learn better ways to cope with who and what they are. But bottom line, people don't change that much. Change is hard. Changing yourself is really hard, perhaps even impossible. Changing another person Well, that's just folly, pure folly. It has been said that having expectations for others and waiting for them to be more like we would have them be is just a down payment on frustration and future disappointment. That's not pessimism. That's realism. But good news is on the way. Change is next to impossible. Transformation is a gift from God. All progress has to do with growth and change. Personal progress is usually cloaked in the power of our will to change ourselves. If we all had just the right information, the right policy, the right data, enough willpower and self-discipline, then we could be just who we were meant to be. But as the writer, musician, and entrepreneur Derek Seaver says, If all we needed was more motivation and more information, then we would all be millionaires with perfect abs. Perhaps you have some experience with trying to change, trying to stop some behavior only to return again and again to what you didn't want to do, much like St. Paul in the epistle reading today. Maybe you have been trying to lose weight for years only to gain it all back again, Maybe you have been trying to grow closer to God through feats of discipline and discipleship and prayer and study only only to feel cold and distant from your Creator. We must remember that Paul's struggle in Romans 7 and this morning's epistle reading is a setup for Romans 8 and the profound comfort of that great scripture which begins. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in some 38 voices, uh, verses later with, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that's in next week's lectionary. I'm looking forward to Pastor Scott's treatment of that all-time favorite text. Can a leopard change its spots? No. 
Can a leopard be transformed? Listen to Isaiah 11, verse 6. The wolf will lie with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Can we become better than we are? Can we be transformed? Stay tuned. The lectionary takes us to the first verses of Matthew 11 every third year on the third Sunday of Advent when we read, when John, that's John the Baptist, was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Was Jesus disappointed? Was his second cousin having second thoughts? That's where today's gospel reading picks up the story. Jesus turned to the crowd and reminds them that John was criticized for his sparse teetotal diet. Some even said John was demon-possessed. And now he, Jesus, is being criticized because he came eating and drinking, too often eating and drinking with the wrong sorts of people. Then Jesus prayed aloud, thanking God for having hidden the purpose of what God is up to from the wise and powerful, but revealing it to the simple and weak. Listen up, because we are getting to a point that has become so familiar and famous that many ears may not pay attention. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you weary? Are you carrying a heavy burden? Do you need a rest? It's been over a month since George Floyd died on a Minneapolis street. It has been weeks and weeks of unending protests, marches, outrage. It has been about 150 days since COVID-19 reached our shores. Almost 130,000 of our fellow citizens have died. We have been isolated and separated isolated to inhibit the virus spread, separated because we cannot agree as to the basic facts and a way forward. We are just over 18 weeks from election day. Our politics have degenerated into tribalism. Ideas and solutions are discounted not because of their concept and content, but because of their conceiver. Who said what bears more weight than what was said. There just seems to be a whole lot of hate and discontent. Are you weary? Are you carrying a heavy burden? Do you need a rest? Forget about the five o'clock news and the cable channel talking heads. Personally, each of us is dealing with something or a whole litany of somethings. We are trying to change, but we can't. Jesus is inviting us into a completely different place. Jesus names our spiritual condition weary, heavy, laden. This is an amazing, compassionate thing to do. Notice and name to tell the truth of a situation. Sometimes it isn't enough simply to have someone notice our fatigue and our burdens. This nothing, this noticing without judgment or fixing is a lesson in empathy for all of us. That just might be the distinction between empathy and pity. But Jesus offers more than empathy. Jesus offers relief. Jesus invites us to take his yoke upon ourselves. This is an interesting image beyond the comprehension of most urban dwellers. A yoke is for a donkey or other beast of burden It is a collar that harnesses the animal for whatever work the master wants the animal to do, like pulling a cart or plowing a field. 
Perhaps Jesus was talking more about yokes that conquering armies laid on the necks and shoulders of prisoners of war and slaves. The yoke was a familiar symbol of burden-bearing, oppression, and conquest. The people Jesus was talking to were Jews. They may have had a second concept of yoke. Yoke, as used by rabbis and religious leaders at that time, had a positive connotation. They used the term yoke for the difficult but joyous task of obedience to the Torah. The joyous task celebrated in Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditated on it day and night. Is that the yoke Jesus offers? To be yoked to a loving, forgiving God, full of grace? We might infer that from his teaching, his way of discipleship, which is not burdensome, but life-giving. He invites the weary to learn from him, for he is not a tyrant who lords it over his disciples, but is gentle and humble in heart. To take his yoke upon yourself is to be yoked to the one to, in whom God's kingdom of justice, mercy, and compassion is breaking into this world, and to find the rest for which the soul longs. That is counterintuitive. That is countercultural. In our world and society, clever and never-ending marketing would have us believe that each and all of us are deficient in some way. Jesus and by no means and Jesus and by no extension at all, God accepts us precisely, precisely where and what we are, with no exceptions. The world has become exceedingly sophisticated in laying out heavy burdens upon us. The largest companies in the world deploy deeply effective psychological research and analyses to encourage us to feel that we must to feel an itch that we must scratch, and we must scratch it immediately, or buy into some product or lifestyle to be the happier, to be happier or more authentic. This has been captured most recently by the acronym FOMO, FOMO, or feeling of missing out. And too often our weariness, our burden is spiritual. Sometimes we live the gospel backwards. Believe in Jesus Christ, keep the commandments, live a moral life, give up your bad habits, and then God will love you. It's not that way at all. God loves you first. At Christmas we see this in action. God became incarnate, down out of the abstract into the concrete. The big question, the gospel question, is have you accepted your acceptance Are you willing to accept the unconditional love of God? God's love is not a reward for anything you've done or can do. God's love calls for your response, for your decision not only to love God in the abstract, but to love God in the concrete here and now. God's love is concrete and specific. In the words of 1 John 4, verses 9 through 10, By this God's love was revealed in us, that God sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. And and this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then, if we are brave and want to be taught by Jesus, we can extend God's radical love to those whom God presents us with each day. Since God lo- God's love is unconditional, and unconditioned, since his loving yoke is easy and the burden of acceptance is light, since it is on learning to judge others, what would it be to live like that? What would it be to love that person who annoys you? What would it be like to love that estranged relative or friend? What would it be like to love that, pol- that politician you not only disagree with, but who act- actively enacts policies that hurt those you already love? Jesus is not asking you to be foolish and merely accept injustice, but he is inviting us to love. And while Jesus meets us 
all where we are and accepts us for who we are, he does not let us stay that way. To encounter Jesus is to be transformed. I cannot think of a single encounter Jesus has in Scripture where the other person did not leave changed or challenged. Jesus is not in the transfixing business. He is in the transforming business. This love can transform you in this world, but it is hard. To follow Jesus' work, it is still a yoke, no matter how easy. Being yoked to Jesus means that he walks with you. Walking with Jesus will transform you from the inside out. I think this is where the marketers and the fear of missing missing out folks get life wrong. To be changed, to be transformed, is not to start with deficiency or want, but with love and acceptance. Now, love and acceptance are simply bad for the economy, but in God's economy, love and acceptance are the starting point. Therefore, Jesus describes discipleship to him as easy and light. Following him makes a beginning and not requiring a series of good behaviors in an attempt to earn love. Once we understand our status as beloved, we can make the radical turn to do the same loving others without condition or remainder. Once we are transformed by Jesus, once we take on his yoke, we no longer need to experience Paul's frustration in Romans 7. Taken on the yoke of Christ, we are, be, we are free to be that all of what God intends us to be. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, empower us, each of us, all of us, individually and corporately as a community to love as deeply as we are loved by God. Being yoked with Jesus, may we serve our Creator and all creation. Transform us into vessels of your love. We ask that you give Don and Ruth Collins' families a real and abiding sense of your presence and comfort. We thank you and praise you for the blessings Don and Ruth were to us and for us and to and for our community. We pray also for Pastor Scott. May his time away allow him to bless his family and restore his soul. We ask that you provide wisdom and discernment to courts, caregivers, and completely and, and courage, comfort and courage to his family. We pray for our nation and community, for those who lead and those who serve. Thank you for allowing us to live in this great nation and in this wonderful place. But we are, <clears throat> we are in a bad place. <clears throat> we beseech you, O Lord, give us the strength and the wisdom to fulfill our citizen, citizenship obligations. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our offering is an act of worship in which we express our gratitude and reliance on God. The willingness to give is a sign of life. The fruit tree gives of its fruit, and we know it is alive. When it no longer gives, we know real life has gone out of it. The heart that hoards the blessings of God is no longer alive with spiritual power to give us to live. Now, we can't pass the plate this morning, but I would remind you to continue sharing your time, talents, and resources. The needs of this church continue even when we cannot gather. You can send your gifts online or in the mail to First Presbyterian Church. Helena, Montana. The address is in your bulletin. Let's dedicate our gifts 
as you receive the tears of Mary Magdalene, the hospitality of Zacchaeus, and the small coins from the widow, accept our earthly gifts and make them holy. Give us your heavenly food and make us worthy to be your servants. Amen. God meets us in the sacraments, communing, communicating grace to us by means of water, bread, and wine. In baptism, whether the newly born or the recently converted, God reminds and assures us of our union with Christ in covenant love. The washing away of our sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit, expecting our love and trust in return. In the Lord's Supper, Christ offers his own crucified body and shed blood to his people, assuring them a share in his death and resurrection. By the Holy Spirit, he feeds us with his resurrection life and binds us to each other as we share one loaf and one cup in our own place this morning. In the 11th chapter of his first epistle to the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul wrote, for, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. For the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betray, betrayed, took, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that after supper in the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared this table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. The gifts of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. Loving, glorious, gracious God, you have fed us at your table. In your mercy, you have nourished us, and we are grateful. In this day, in this time, in our various places, we have connected through the centuries with a church everlasting, those who before us broke bread and took the cup. Help us now as we leave this place, this worship, to continue the work of the Holy Universal Church, to practice the communion of the saints, and with hearts and souls refresh to seek your will. Help us now that we have been fed to feed the hungry, invite in the stranger, and visit the imprisoned. You have met us where we are, O Lord, and filled our needs yet again. May we do the same for all of your children. May we leave this worship to love abundantly. May we love you with all our hearts. May we love our neighbors as ourselves. Please join with me and pray in the prayer that Jesus taught his friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please receive this charge and benediction. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short, grace to risk something big, for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, 
keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always and forever. Amen.